I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. So come on, let's get this money. Last week, we spoke to two players in the entertainment industry about their proposals for a safe reopening. This week, we'll hear from the government. How soon might we be able to party again? And later, the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. The lab's profit is up 54% and Barita is considering listing up to 300 million new shares. We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. 16 listed companies, including the Jamaica Stock Exchange, can now hold their annual general meetings online. The Supreme Court gave the approval last week. The JSC had filed a claim on June 8 on behalf of 17 listed companies in light of challenges with venue spaces that would make it difficult to observe physical distancing. The court order means that all but one of the represented companies, Mayberry Jamaican Equities, can hold virtual meetings and allow their shareholders to participate and vote electronically either before or at the meeting. Mayberry Jamaican Equities is registered in St. Lucia and as such is not held to the laws of the Companies Act and did not need representation. In the meantime, companies covered by the order, which might have missed their 2020 AGM deadlines, now have up to December 31 to call these meetings. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, has revised its economic outlook for Latin America and the Caribbean as the region continues to be impacted by COVID-19. The IMF is now forecasting a contraction of 9.4% for the region. That's a sharp decline from the 5.2% projected in April, which already would have been the worst performance since at least 1980, the first year in the IMF's World Economic Outlook database. According to the multilateral lending agency, most countries in Latin America are still struggling to contain infections. Non-performing loans jumped by 18.5% or $3.6 billion in the March 2020 quarter when compared with the previous year. According to the Bank of Jamaica, NPLs totaled $23 billion across the entire financial sector for the quarter. It's the first time in eight years that these unserviced loans have grown this fast and is a reflection of the difficulties consumers and businesses are having to pay bills in light of COVID-19. Auditing firm KPMG says it expects NPLs to rise between 4 and 9 percent by March 2021. The Jamaican dollar fell below $140 to 1 U.S. last week for the first time since April. It opened Friday at $139.88. The J dollar has been under pressure over the last few months, with less foreign exchange coming into the island due to the fallout in tourism and a drop in remittance inflows resulting from the pandemic. The tourism minister recently indicated that the pandemic has cost the country $400 million a day in lost tourism revenue. And according to the Bank of Jamaica, net remittance inflows have decreased by more than 8% to $160 million U.S. million. In April alone, the decrease was calculated at $15 million U.S. The last time the Jamaican dollar was under 140 was on April 15, when it traded for $139.62. Since then, it's traded as high as $147.39 on May 18. In 2018, the poverty rate fell to 12.6%, the lowest it's been in a decade. The Planning Institute of Jamaica PIOJ and Statin recently released the data, which has a two-year lag. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark notes that the figure is a 6.7% decline compared with 2017 and a 40% fall from 2015. He says the decline may be attributed to an increase in real GDP, employment, remittances, as well as a slowing in the rate of inflation. And international credit ratings agency Fitch has upgraded ratings for the Digicel corporate family. The revision follows the conclusion of the company's debt swap, which has slashed 1.6 billion U.S. dollars off its debt burden. 
97% of the company's bondholders have accepted the new terms. The move reduces Digicel's debt from $7 billion to $5.4 billion U.S. and also lowers its annual interest payments by around $125 million U.S. Primary ratings analyst at Fitch, Sol Ahmad, says the debt restructuring has only bought Digicel some time as the telecoms giant still has financial woes. Digicel Group 0.5 is now rated at triple C for its long-term foreign currency issuer default rating. Digicel Limited has been upgraded from restricted default to triple C, and Digicel International Finance remains at triple C+. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. And when we come back, we continue our look at the entertainment industry's possible reopening. We'll hear from the chairman of the Entertainment Advisory Board in the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, Howard McIntosh. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agent. Insurance made easy. Welcome back to Taking Stock. Bumper to bumper, not bumper to fender. That was one idea pitched by one party promoter last week. But can that really work? To discuss whether this plan, among others, can work, we have Chairman of the Entertainment Advisory Board in the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport, Howard McIntosh. Hi, Howard. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Kalila. How are things? Um, not bad. So you represent the Culture Entertainment Ministry, and as you are aware, there has been a discussion about the possible reopening of the entertainment sector and what that may look like, how that may work. What are your thoughts on it? I am chairman of the Entertainment Advisory Board, and so we work closely with the ministry. I actually don't work for the ministry, but work very closely with the entertainment division and, of course, the minister. And part of what we set out to do this year is to try and ensure that data has been ga gathered on entertainment. And that was even before COVID began. And during the COVID period, we have accelerated that emphasis in terms of trying to get more data. As you may be aware, Kalila, part of the challenge with the industry is that lack of data. And therefore, sometimes people can't really understand it and people not sure about it and i'm starting from here because the first thing that we have to do is understand what is the entertainment industry because most times people think about parties and so when we're even talking about the reopening of the industry we're not just talking about having big parties or big festivals because immediately people run to some fest and dream and rebel mm -hmm. and start talking about parties but what we are talking about is entertainment so we are talking about the visual and the performing arts. We are talking about cinemas. We are talking about sport because for us in, in Jamaica, uh, sport is part of our physical culture. True. We are talking about fashion and modeling. And we are talking about the theater. So we are talking about a number of things, all of which are closed as we speak right now. And so as we talk about a reopening, we need to understand the impact of it. And based on the work that we have done, we find that you're looking at an industry that, in terms of contribution to GDP, you're looking at about 200 billion, and you're looking at that which is about 9% of GDP. That's a and lot of money. It is. For an entire quarter, essentially, about three months now. Correct. And you're looking at about 75,000 persons that are employed to the industry. And why is that important to highlight first? Because we want people to understand that it, is a, it does have a significant impact and a number of persons are indeed impacted by what is happening. So as we talk about reopening, it's, we're talking about a lot of sectors that need to be reopened, a lot of businesses, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of uh, event providers, a lot of stagehands, a lot of persons who are, are not working and have not been working since March 15, and with an outlook that is not necessarily rosy. And the supporting industries too, because if I'm not going out at night, I don't need to go do my hair and my nails and get a new outfit well, there you go. and all these things. 
you've now raised the question of linkages, which mm -hmm. is why it is so important to educate everyone on what the entertainment industry means. Because when we see a festival or an event, we immediately think about, well, the artists and the band and the performers on stage, but we're not necessarily thinking about the, the hair salons. And we're not thinking about all the vendors. And we're not thinking about the barbers. And we're not thinking about all of the other linked industries that actually are not benefiting. Because once sport is down and entertainment is down, there are a number of persons who just are not benefiting from it. Absolutely. And so Howard, do we have an updated figure? Because the last I heard from the minister in late April was that the losses were around $26 billion. So, so where are we now at the end of uh, if, June? If you look at that figure, and as you just correctly calculated, it's going to probably be twice that um, based on where we are now. And we, ca we have to keep calculating because we've effectively lost an entire quarter. So something like uh, 50 billion? Yes. Wow. Easily. You know, there are particular events you can look at now because when the minister announced it, I don't think uh, some first had announced that they were cancelling Dream has announced that they're canceling. As you're aware, Carnival has, did not happen, even though there's some discussion. The truth is everything is driven by the Ministry of Health. Because whenever we talk about reopening, whatever we're talking about, we're talking about balancing lives and livelihood. And I know, and I want to take time out to compliment the, the Prime Minister, the government, and the entire team for the tremendous work that they're doing in terms of trying to, to deal with this uncertain situation. Our charge is to try and represent the industry in these discussions, provide the data, and, and see how it can happen. So what we've, what we've undertaken, Kalila, is a lot of research. What's happening internationally in terms of the reopening of the industries abroad, in terms of sports, in terms of entertainment and specifically things like driving concerts and, and and tailgate parties and and so we've gathered all the research that we can and now we're trying to see how best to work with the ministry of health work with the various ag agencies in terms of the protocols that can be used and adapted to see what events can actually happen and uh, I think we're pretty close uh, in terms of coming up with some things. We're hoping that come next week, the, the, the minister may be able to make some announcements in that regard, in terms of possible events. Uh, and we're going to be working on trying to ensure the, 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 not just the base protocols, because we know about the sanitizing and we know about the hand washing, but looking at specific activities and see how best they can work. For well, us not, here, to, not to preempt whatever the minister decides and announces in the week, but what types of measures are we looking at? Because we had this conversation last week with some people, some party promoters in the space, and they were making, they've come up with their own set of proposals, their own set of recommendations as to how this could work. I was and still am very skeptical, especially when we're talking about the, the party space, the nightlife space where people are consuming alcohol. They still have the most discretion in normal times, much less yes. when you're in, under the influence of alcohol yes. and add COVID to the mix now. I'm not sure how that might work. In the protocols, there are different things being, being discussed. So let's talk about like cinemas and theaters before we talk about even the parties. Looking at the possibility of a capacity 20, like you use 25 or 50 percent capacity of the venues and that would allow the social distancing protocols to be in effect and then you'd have to have different arrangements as it relates to food and beverages just like the theater and cinema space let's talk so about I heard, no, I heard that recommendation coming from the promoters too about the capacity issue but then yeah. people still need to make money can it can that be done profitably if you, if, how, how do you have an event or even open up your theater and you depend on having a certain number of people in the theater or at the event in order to make money and you're telling me now you can open but you can't have the number of people that you need to turn a profit or to even break even? 
which is why whatever we're doing, Kalila, has to be done in phases. The idea was to do a phase one, and let's say we're looking at 25% in terms of capacity. I'm just using that as an example. And then you test the protocols, and then hopefully within a specified period, let's say 30, 60 days, then maybe you move, move to phase two, which would be 50%. The idea is to, to get it reopened in as safe a, a, a manner as possible and one that satisfies all of the protocols and all of the conditions and guidelines set out by the Ministry of Health and the COVID-19 task force. We understand the issue of profitability. We understand the concerns. The reality now, though, is that in trying to develop this balance, we're going to have to take a phased approach to this, test it first, show that we com can comply, which brings me to the other issue. As it relates to the festival economy, as we call it, um, and, the, and, and the, the parties, we have a reputation. And one of the things I have no hesitation in talking about is that there's going to be a lot of responsibility put on the party promoters and any of the event organizers to ensure compliance. Our reputation, unfortunately, in our industry is not one necessarily of compliance. And one of the, the things coming out of this particular situation that we're seeing is, yeah, we're talking more and we're encouraging a dialogue. You and I are talking and there's so much discussion taking place, but we have to take some lessons from it. And we're going to have to learn the lessons. Some of the lessons are going to be along the lines of certification. Some of the lessons are going to be along the lines of compliance because we're now going to have to institute best practices in everything that we do. Now, we have a reputation here. I was listening to a survey yesterday uh, in relation to the reopening of the industry where the question was just put to the public. And most of the responses said that the entertainment industry should not actually reopen right now given oh. the concerns that was what the responses were so now, it's quite possible that even if they do reopen people won't go well one there's that but the the the, the preponderance of the evidence suggests not because you know, if you look at what happened with the beaches when they were reopened recently and the other places people because you know people have really been I like to say suffering mm -hmm. <laughs> for the we're last missing, three months. We're, we're missing the socialization. We're, yeah, we're, man. Be yeah. Because that's how we are. That's how we are, our people. We, that's what we are actually best known for, the people. You know, that's our greatest asset, that the, the people. And we like, to, we like to touch base and we like to hug and we like to knock fists and we like to do all of these things that right now we're not really allowed to do. So the responsibility is going to be on the event organizers to ensure that compliance. Because if we do not comply, even if we get a break to have one or two events or a few events, if we're not complying, we run the serious risk of the approvals being withdrawn. And that is something that we don't want. Mm. So I know we're agitating to get the industry reopened. I know we want to get things going. The fact of the matter is, if we do, even in the phases as we have suggested, we're going to have to work together to ensure. And sometimes I feel like I'm, I may even end up going to some of these events myself. <laughs> just to, just to, just you to. You are the party police, Howard. <laughs> yeah, well, just turn, turn the party police because we can't. Are you, going Sorry, to be, are you going to be the monitor like they do at the school dances? Hey, two, two <laughs> <Yeah>. feet apart. <laughs> three well, feet apart. Are, are you, know, you bring out the, the ruler, you meet the, 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 the invigilator, the exams. <laughs> the truth of the matter is with us, if we are successful, and I know the minister and her team are working hard to try and, and get some level of approval to have some level of reopening, if we are successful, we must comply. We must work with the authorities. And, and you asked about an example. So let's take, for example, one that has been just discussed, the driving concert. So one of the questions that has been put on the table is, 
Should you serve food or not? Should you have bathrooms or not? I mean, that's, that, that, that's the level of discourse that is taking place to see what makes sense right now for phase one. Which means, for example, you couldn't have a four-hour concert. You might have a one-and-a-half-hour concert. So maybe you have two one-and-a-half-hour concerts rather than one three-hour concert. Mm. You know, these are the considerations because as you are correctly pointing out, Kalila, to the extent that you allow people to get together, as long as we go and get together, we go and get together. So even if we're going to the bathroom, or even if we're going to food, so you might have a situation where you don't have any food um, there where you can go to. You may have food served. Or you could have a requirement for the driving concert where there's no food and you have to bring your own igloo and food and you must stay in that space. You must be six feet uh, apart from each other in the different vehicles. However, there, there comes another risk because Kalila may see some friends of hers over there and then all of a sudden within, within half hour of the thing, there's a congregation of persons. Mm -hmm. But so so these are the types of and real you know considerations. Exactly what's gonna happen. <laughs> and, and you see, you see how quickly you said you said that's exactly, exactly what's, what's gonna, gonna happen. happen. You know but, it. But this is part of why you now the approvals and the reopening is then a little bit difficult because it cannot happen, especially now, because those are the protocols that we have. And so this is why we're being very careful in the deliberations, very careful. We know everybody wants it to happen. We, we want it to happen. However, but right now there's been, a bigger have concern. We been, have we been unfair to the players in the entertainment industry throughout all of this? Though? Because I, I was speaking with some other promoters this morning too, and they were making the point that there has been this big push for tourism to reopen, but tourism and entertainment go hand in hand. Tourists come here not only for beaches, but because they want to experience Jamaican culture too. They come here because they want to be entertained while they're here too. So how is it, that person was making the point, that how is it there's this big push for tourism, but no push for entertainment? Well, you know, happy you asked that question, Kalila. And, you know, the, the pandemic has allowed for a lot of dialogue and a lot of discussion. Our hope, given the position I hold, and along with the board and along with the industry, is that this type of discussion continues. Why do I say that? Because a number of these industry associations have been around for, from long before. The crisis, the pandemic, has forced us to come together. What has happened in other industries, like tourism, is that they've been able to properly represent their contribution to the economy. Part of the reason I started with a discussion on data, because you immediately responded by saying, oh, so that's what we're talking about in terms mm -hmm. of the level. We have not over the years represented on an ongoing basis the contribution to the, 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 the social fabric, the national economy, how we our, our contribution to development. Now, with that being better understood, we can now put forward, uh, I think, uh, a, a, a good argument that we need to be properly considered. Before now, you're right. We were being treated unfairly because I don't think enough persons understood what it really means when we talk about entertainment. Now, we don't when you say, when you say we, part. Howard, you're, you're in the entertainment space too? I do a number of different things and have done a number of different things. I'm actually a sound system owner from a long time. Okay. <laughs> and, so um, that helps to add, add perspective to what you're saying. Yeah, man. And Well, I'm heavily involved in sports, as you may know, because I actually am in charge of 41 countries around, around the world uh, um, as, in, as being a representative of CONCACAF. So I'm heavily involved in football and sports generally. But um, I've you know, been one of the co-producers of Sting. I produced Sunsplash in the past. And so done a number of different things and continue to invest. My, my, my thing now is to invest in, in entertainment. So heavily invested in entertainment. 
So I have a perspective, especially from the sound system angle, that um, that that um, I bring to the table in terms of understanding what happens. And I'm a partner in some of these events. So, so the idea now coming back coming back to the point you you, you, you the question you raised, we have to understand. Now people better understand what entertainment is, what its contribution is. I think now we can put forward an argument uh, in relation to it. So my quick answer to your question, have, have we been treated unfairly? Absolutely, in the past. But this is why now the data becomes so important and we have to be consistent in the presentation of that data and how we work, not only in times of crisis. We have to work together even post-COVID and develop the associations because I, I see where there's a lot of discussion now in relation to associations be popping up. We don't need 100 associations. What we need are some strong associations, some strong lobby groups at the level, at the level of the, the JHTA, since we're talking about tourism, mm -hmm. the Jamaica Hotel and Tourism Association, at the level of the PSOJ, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the type of lobby group, if we're serious, about promoting and developing the industry, that's the that's the level we need that's to be so at. That's so true. So that that's when so we, true. yeah, so that when we, so when we speak, people understand that we're speaking about economic contribution, social development, and this is why it's important. And this is something that we've never had, and it's something that we are definitely trying to to encourage. The, this, the institutional strengthening of the industry associations to ensure that the economic significance, that economic impact of the industry is well understood. Thanks for joining me, Howard. Much appreciated. Anytime. And thank, thank you for, for inviting me and for the conversation. And last, I should say to the people that continue to work on the front line to continue to to protect all of us i want to say thank you on behalf of myself of, and my family of course and on, on behalf of the entertainment advisory board and on behalf of the industry and keep up the good work kalila and Thanks. keep the conversation i look going. out for the minister's comments in the week as well yes yes uh, I, we're all we all have our fingers crossed that by by Wednesday of next week, we'll, we'll be smiling a little bit. <laughs> All right, good. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. When we come back, I've got your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced last week with the combined index gaining 1%. 94 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, June 26, 2020. 44 advanced, 43 declined and 7 stayed the same. Nearly 495 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $1.8 billion. Pulse Investments traded the most taking up 72% of market volume. The stock gained $0.09 cents to open the week at $2.96. Mailpack Group traded the second most, with people buying and selling 34 million shares in the company. Mailpack gained $0.06 cents to open the week at $1.94. And Trans Jamaican Highway rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 5% of market volume. The stock gained $0.04 cents to close last week at $1.39. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. Derriman Trading Company 2021 preference shares jumped 16% to close last week at $1.80. Proven Investments USD rose 14% to close last week at $0.24 cents US. And SSL Venture Capital Jamaica rounded out the biggest gains to open the week at $0.85. Cents. 
On the losing side now, Caribbean flavors and fragrances fell 16% to close last week at $11.70. Palace Amusement fell 14% to end last week at $1,633.78 a share. And Caribbean Cream lost nearly 14%, down to $2.49. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined by Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Dwayne Taylor, Research and Strategy Analyst at Sagicor Investments, Jody Ann Aris, and Financial Analyst and Contributor to Finance Twitter, J.A. Mark Gale. Hi, everybody. Mark, Jody Ann, and our newbie, Dwayne. Welcome, Dwayne. Your first time on the show. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Just give the, the, the viewers a little bit of background about yourself. You're, are, have you been at Ideal for a long time? No, I just joined the company uh, in April, but I've been working in the industry. I've worked at uh, SSL, JMMB, and Sagicor Investments. Okay, good. Well, let's get right into it. So some results are out. Mailpack is one of them that I saw was rather impressive. This is a company that I've been bullish on since they announced the IPO. I was always excited about this one. And I think Corona actually has improved, has seen them seizing opportunities presented. jodi give me your th thoughts on Mailpack. Um, I think one of the things that you're seeing in the results is really they starting to benefit from that having to not pay tax benefits because they have listed. So if you look at tax, if you look at the profit before tax, it's not as up as much. But once you look at that line below, then you realize that having not paying tax has really benefited. Um, the company would have benefited because persons, they had the mail pack local. And as you know, with COVID, persons would have wanted to avoid interacting with persons. So if it is that I could then order my basic items and have them delivered at home, it would have been safe. So they would have seen an uptick there. However, on the other side, where it is the looking at importing for public consumer discretionary goods, there may have been a decline. And I'm still optimistic, though, for the company. I'm still bullish on Mailpack, seeing that they are able to offer services in a way that persons within a climate like COVID or in a climate where we are moving towards doing more digital interaction, that they have a platform that set up and can enable something like that. So, Dwayne, I see where they are now about to consider a dividend there at Mailpack in a COVID environment where a lot of other companies have been saying, you know, we're going to hold off on dividends for right now. Is it a, a wise thing for them to, to be considering dividend at this time? Are they in a strong enough position to do it? When you look at their cash flow statement, you notice that they have, you know, roughly 200 million, uh, roughly 200 million available to them. Uh, I would say there are two sides to it. You have to think about it from the investment the investors point of view where you know persons are looking for some additional income but also from the business side you know mail pack needs to remain relatively liquid to ensure that if there are any issues that come up they can be able to offset those additional costs so it's a split right. decision um i think it's still a good move i still i think it's a good move on their part we just have to see how much it is that they're actually going to pay out to investors to see if it was the wisest of decision. Mm -hmm. Mark, what are your thoughts on Mailpack right now? Yeah, so I mean, I've been bullish on Mailpack from, from the jump. Um, I really, I, I love the company. Um, you know, what I will say, I mean, their, their last quarter results, meaning Q1 of, um, you know, 2020, which was, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, the three months ending March 31st, 2020. Those results were very, very good. They actually beat the, the, the quarter before, which was their um, strongest quarter typically, right? So it's end of year, you know, so December, you know, in, in that type of business, you know, you're shipping, everybody's buying stuff around Christmas time. So you typically tend to see very, very strong quarter in November, um, December. And so the fact that they outperformed, you know, that quarter in February, March, was very, very strong to me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I agree with, with, with what Dwayne was saying. 
um, you know, in terms of you know their their dividend, it really so Mailpack is in a growth phase right now, right? And what growth companies you know want to be doing is to reinvest in as much cash as they can into the business, so you know um, they can overall you know just grow the business very very aggressively. When they were listing in the prospectus, there were two kind of like thoughts. One is you know, we, we, the, the e-commerce market in Jamaica is only 6% um, in terms of total commerce. And so there's significant growth potential there. So they will be investing in growth. But then on the flip side, you know, they also did promise to pay up to 75% of, you know, um, previous year's profits um, in dividends. So, you know, yeah, this dividend announcement in terms of how much it will be, will be very, very interesting to watch because they're going to have to manage um, the tension between reinvesting for growth and also fulfilling um, their promise to investors uh, at, the, at the listing. Mm -hmm. And then another junior market company that I've been bullish on is The Lab, and they're reporting very impressive results. I think it's something like up 54%. 54% increase in profits for the, the period for their second quarter. jodi give me your impressions of the lab. I can't imagine um, there's anything bad you have to say. <laughs> I think similar to mail, to mail packets, you've seen a company benefiting from not having to pay tax. So in the same, when you look at mail pack in the previous or corresponding quarter, they would have had paid tax. And without having to do that, there's more coming back to the company. So that is always good. Um, what I, one of the things I noticed they pointed to was that there were some areas that were better that they did they had increases in in terms of and I think production was probably an area that was impacted and they cited COVID for that reason. And one of the things I want to point to with the lab is we had said it at the start when we we're going into a period of COVID to so say what it is that we should look at for stocks. And you really want to look at companies that are going to have management that's going to work with the flow of things and changing in the way that things are going to be changing with a global pandemic. And I think the lab would have done that. So they are boosting areas that would have received increased traction because of COVID, as you would presume companies would want to get more information out there. It's now in a digital space that we have to communicate with the clients and the customers. And so they would have seen a boost there. And how it is that they're going to manage going forward if it is that production now requires that you have to do more closed space interactions and how it impacts how it is that they do going forward. So you want to look at companies that have the management talent that will be able to work with the changes that are coming and react speedily. Okay, so management talent is, is very important. Yes, but the, remind me, this, these results are for the quarter ended what month? March. Oh, April. 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 So, it would, so include, would some, a little bit of COVID. it would include some COVID. So, so right. there is, although management talent is brilliant at the lab, big up Kimala Bennett and her team, uh, there is some surprise in it for me because advertising has been a very, very hard hit mm -hmm. industry. I would know I'm not in advertising, I'm in media and we depend on advertising. Right. <laughs> That's how we make money. We don't make money by, by mm -hmm. views. We make money by you know, advertisers who want to reach our viewers. And that's one of the lab's core streams mm -hmm. as well, producing advertisements for customers. And so, Dwayne, how do you see them possibly being impacted in their third quarter, which would be May, June, July, August? So in terms of lab, it's amongst a list of stocks that you know, I've been looking at that there's a bit of concern about how sustainable the business is for them. Uh, you know, COVID, you know, as I mentioned earlier with Mark off camera, you know, we have to learn how to live with it. So the lab, they, they mentioned in the financials that they're taking a lot of cost containment measures to try and ensure that, you know, money isn't being spent on areas that uh, won't bring in much return for them. So I think as they continue to navigate the arena and also, you know, capitalize on business that is viable during this period, then they can possibly sustain the business. But I do anticipate that they're going to see some level of impact from just, you know, companies not looking to advertise as much, you know, cutting costs, you know, those, those things that are already taking place in the market. Mark? 
Yeah, so um, yeah, as you had said, Kalila, I mean, the truth is that in the middle of a recession or, you know, when a recession starts, one of the first places that companies look, you know, I mean, the first thing they think about is, okay, how do we cut expenses? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're going down the list of expenses, it, it's very, very tempting. Like one of the first places to cut is marketing. They right? always cut marketing. Yeah, exactly. Me. And and that's actually counterintuitive. Media, mm -hmm. and something that we haven't discussed yet in a, in a broad sense, not only on this show, but in general in Jamaica, how media has been impacted. There are right. many media houses that have had to cut staff as a result of COVID because of the loss of advertising revenue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and so that's pretty yeah. common. Um, it's actually counterintuitive. They, they really and truly, companies shouldn't because, you know, I'll put it this way. The best companies during the middle of a recession, they actually increase ad spend because the, the return on investment, the return on ad spend that you can get in a real recession increases because everybody pulls back, right? So it's one of those counterintuitive things that a lot of companies don't take advantage of. But, um, but yeah, so generally speaking, you know, they will pull back. And so, you know, one of the byproducts of that is that service firms, so not even, so, so the lab is a service firm within the advertising agency, right? Like, um, and so those firms typically tend to, to be hit first and hardest. And so to be honest, you know, these results as at, you know, end of April, it was very surprising to me. I was expecting it to be a lot worse. Um, but it actually was very, 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 very strong numbers. I mean, um, you know, just just in terms of some data, their first half revenue, H1 revenue, is currently running at a, a rate of about 75% of 2019, the entire fiscal year for 2019. So, you know, they're, they're six months into the year and, you know, they've already achieved 75% of the revenue of the prior year. So that's, that's very, very good. Their gross margins have slipped a little bit from 37% to 35%. But their net profits, their, their um, H1, their half, you know, H1 um, net profits, which is the first half of the year, relative to all of fiscal year 2019, is even, even after you adjust for the, after the, the tax benefit from listing, it is still at about 80.6% of 2019 fiscal year. So, you know, they are, you know, generally speaking, they're doing very, very well. They have a lot of cash, you know, all the, the cash that they raise from the listing is still on their balance sheet. They haven't um, you know, done the acquisitions that they spoke about, which, you know, so there are two sides to that. One side is, you know, what's happening where that is concerned. But then the other side is that has served them well in the middle of a crisis. You know, right now they have roughly about two years of operating, experience, uh, operating expenses in cash. And so they're very, very, you know, their balance sheet is very, very strong. Um, and they're well prepared to kind of ride up the storm. Like if, if revenues go to zero tomorrow, you know, they can continue paying bills for two years. So, um, you know, uh, quite frankly, the lab is doing pretty well, considering. That's, yeah, that's, that's really impressive. Like you, I, I didn't expect it to be as strong as it was because of, like we said, COVID starting in March. Um, so Jody Ann, another company that we've been tracking is Barita, and that's because of the APO that they are planning. The board of directors recently approved plans for the APO. It now has to go before the shareholders to approve. Do we have a sense of the numbers yet as to how much they might be looking to raise? Um, I know they have indicated the number of shares that they plan to put to market if it is that it's approved. Um, I think we can probably do a proxy. Generally, your APO comes at somewhat of a discount to prevailing market price, so we could probably do a proxy and give a estimate, but I haven't heard from the company any idea of what it is that they are planning to raise in this APO. So I think they said 200 million shares is what they're going to be, 200 right. million is what they're going to be offering and with the option to upsize by 100 million. So I was just looking at the, the GSC app to see where Barita is today and they're at $52 and right. one cent. So let's do some Quick math. Dwayne or Mark, have either of you worked it out yet and saved me some maths? Yeah, so if they, it depends on how aggressive they, they, they are, right? So Barita, in the last rights issue, they gave a significant discount. It's like a 50% or 45% discount on the prevailing market rate at the time, right? It was like, I think it was trading at $90 and, and you know, yeah. they, they did the listing, um, the rights issue at about $45 or, or $40 or something. So if it, is, if it is as aggressive as that, you know, using that $50, um, you know, high watermark, you said Khalidah, then you're looking at about $25. If it's $25, then 
you know, and there is, you know, 200 million, then that, that's about four, between 400 and $500 million, um, you know, sorry, 4.5 to $5 billion, um, you know, somewhere in that region. Uh, and, and that's if it's not oversubscribed. If they do upsize, then, you know, that goes up to, you know, six, seven, eight billion dollars. So you're looking at anywhere from four and a half billion to, you know, six, seven, eight billion, all depending on, you know, the discount that they give and, uh, you know, the, the, the price that, that, that they go with. And how does this compare to the two offers that they did last year? They did a rights issue and I forget what the other offer was. So the thing with Barita is that they're actually very, very um, well capitalized as it stands right now. As at the you know, end of March, they had $17.3 billion in cash you know, that they, for them to do deals. So these guys are just, they're very, very aggressive. Their la last rights issue, um, they raised um, somewhere in that, that region, it was uh, I think like $9 billion or, or no, uh, somewhere between yeah. like four, four and, and nine billion. Jordan, you can, Correct me on the exact figure, but so 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 it's it's it is well within the um you know that sort of range. So this would be among the larger raises in well ever really because we look at Trans Jamaica. Trans was what ten billion, eleven billion. Uh, Proven's APO was coming in around ten billion. They had to cancel that one, and what JMMB was ten billion. So this would be you know almost comparable no well if you, if they take the discount like you said mark it would be what like right. five billion but it's still pretty pretty sizable Dwayne, can they do it are they do you think that the the appetite is there and the money is there right now when people are shying away from the market Dwayne? uh to be honest i do believe they can do it despite the the covid the pandemic that we're in uh, we have to remember that the investors range from not only individuals, but, you know, a lot of companies, they will also have to participate in it. Um, you know, Barita is an interesting company. Uh, it's, it has been growing aggressively. And I believe persons that have a vested interest in at least the trajectory that they're heading on will look to invest in it. So it's just a matter of, we, we just have to watch and see to see if um, it will actually be filled. But based off of just uh, what, what happened earlier this year with Trans Jamaica, it being the largest in the history of um, the JSC, I do believe that we can expect for at least majority of it to be filled. The, the right for, it to, for the, the upsize, the option to upsize, that may not come to fruition, but we'll have to watch and see what, what, what will happen. What, what's Marita doing with all this money? That, that, that is a question right there. And, it, and honestly, so I, I, I'll take a, I'll make the bull case, right? Um, I actually believe that there is a very, very good chance that it will be upsized. Um, I, I don't think that they're going to have a major issue raising all of that cash, precisely because, quite frankly, right now, they don't need it. And it's one of those things where, um, you know, typically investors don't really like giving money to a situation where, you know, you have a high risk of loss. They are extremely well capitalized. You know, their risk... Um, uh, you know, their um, uh, compliance risk ratio, the, the capital to risk weighted assets ratio, um, where, where the minimum regulatory requirement is 10%, theirs is 41%. So, you know, they are sitting very, very pretty right now. Um, it, so this just tells us, uh, it's telling the market that, you know, they clearly have an appetite to do some very, very big things. Um, and, you know, so I think that's likely to be very, very attractive to, you know, a lot of investors. So I honestly don't see them having an issue, you know, being able to raise, you know, to do, yeah, upsize it. Mm. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Let's take our final break. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, was brought to you by Ideal Portfolio Services.
That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and of course share with a friend. Also turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all the other features. The goal is to get to 50,000 subscribers this year, and we want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. So share, share, share. Now this week on Money Mondays JA, we're looking at pensions, why you should get one. And on Money Moves JA with Exim Bank, we walk you through the steps to build your own business website. And we have some giveaways. Now follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow Taking Stock JA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check out the description box below for their contact information. Tell a friend about taking stock. Investing is the new sexy, so let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Khalilo Reynolds. Stay safe.